is an Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering sex education, season three, episode one. In this episode, there is a new headmistress at the school, and she does something that I wondered why it hadn't already been done. I actively wondered in the midst of this episode, and it turns out she's got more sense than some of the others that we have seen come before her. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Ashley for commissioning this episode. Um, Out of the gate, guys, I just want to mention, because my voice might sound a little bit strange, Um, as many of you know, I have a facial twitch that's been kind of growing worse over the years, and I get treatments from a neurologist, Botox injections into the nerves to keep the twitch down. And uh, the injections recently that were placed around my mouth are making it really tough for me to talk. And I'm managing, but it is affecting the way I'm pronouncing things or my like lips aren't keeping up with what I'm trying to make them do. You can insert any joke there that you like. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that because it's the sort of thing that, you know, if it were only visible on camera, how weird it looks, because it does look weird, then I might not say anything, but it is certainly coming across in the voice recordings as well. So I feel like I have to mention it. But anyway, thank you very much, Ashley, for commissioning this episode and this whole season, Ashley pre-commissioned the whole season. Um, And I am really excited because I had a couple of moments like over this past, like, I guess over this past winter, where moments from the show were coming to mind. And um, Rashawn actually brought it up because she had started watching it and didn't realize that I had covered it. And we got to talking about a couple scenes. And then I realized how much I like missed these characters. And I'm really excited to be back. So this episode focuses on the reset. It's a new year. Our kids are, you know, I guess they would be juniors now. And uh, when we open the episode, we get, as I said in my post, when I announced that I was about to start recording this episode, this is like the horniest montage I have ever seen. And I have watched the other seasons of this show. So that really tells you something, in my opinion. This montage goes somehow above and beyond. First, we have the fucking in the car scene, and that's with Otis. And I immediately was like, wait, wait, who is that? Because I had forgotten about how he slept with Ruby last season. And even had I remembered that he slept with Ruby, I wouldn't expect her to want to fuck him again. Apparently, her own friends, when they hear the rumor about her, as cruel as her friends are, and as much as they would like normally be willing to tease her, I feel like, they don't believe the rumor because they are so certain that she would never stoop to fucking Otis. So when we find out that it's her and they're still fucking, I could not stop laughing because you know what? Good for her. She is getting off and she's just like, "Mm, somebody who's actually good at this is actually kind of rare. So I think I'm going to hold on to it and get everything out of it that I can. And I can't even be mad at that. You know, I think a lot of women understand the importance of a guy who knows how to fuck. I mean, this is a major reason why I stayed with my high school boyfriend for a long time, even though he was a complete fuck boy who lied constantly about things that did not matter. But he was a really good lay. And I could even tell like back then, you know, and he was also like a, a lot of people when I started seeing him were like, what is she doing? Because 
socially. He was like several tiers below me. One might say that uh, his attractiveness level was significantly lower than mine. I didn't agree at the time, but looking back, I can kind of see what they meant. And yet he was just like really good at it, though, truly. So I really felt like I understood where she was coming from, because as much as like as an older woman, I might be much less tolerant of overlooking certain things that I don't like about a guy in order to like justify continuing to sleep with him. When you're that age, horniness is just like completely overwhelming and you're just kind of willing to do whatever, you know, like it happens. It's fine. So, oh, Ashley's here. Ashley says, I think I completely forgot I had commissioned this season already. I was thinking to myself, I really needed to message you about this. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, Rowan says, your hair looks great. Thanks, Rowan. Samantha's here too. Hi, everybody. Um, So, I, like, we go through also, it's a montage of various people. And they're all either hooking up masturbating or mutually masturbating in the case of I cannot remember her name and I'm going to feel bad now but the like debate team girl um Vivi Vivi she is like hooking up with somebody online I think I don't remember if we saw how she met this guy remember guys it's been over a year since I I watched the last season and as much as I try to refresh myself before I cover something, if I, there's been a break, I'm not always able to, and I wasn't able to with this. So you may have to feed me some names, but I'm, I'm, it's coming back to me a lot of it. Um, and we see Adam's mom hooking up with some random guy and they are like going for it. And I was so happy about that. I am just like, you guys know, I have been rooting for her from the start and wanting to know more about her. And I'm delighted that we're getting this. We have uh, Eric and Adam and they are, as it turns out, just doing like blowjobs and hand jobs and stuff, but they're not having penetrative sex. And we find out later that Eric really wants to. And I'm really curious about what the deal is with that because I can't help but wonder if Adam has never done that before. That's like oftentimes an obstacle to men who have some like latent still issues with homophobia or a feeling of just shame, you know? Um, and it's understandable. Like anal sex is just sort of a, it's a loaded thing, you know? So I can understand just being kind of like afraid to experiment because things going wrong during anal sex, that kind of going wrong can be really embarrassing. And it, like, I have some friends that things have gone very wrong. So I know whereof I speak. Thankfully, I have never been in that position, but I have heard really hair curling stories. So that's why my hair is so curly right now. It's all the stories. And uh, we also get um, Ola and, oh my God, Lily hooking up. Um, can I just reiterate how much I love Lily's like bedroom and her mood lighting and everything being like silvery or purplish and the whole thing is just so... It's great. She has committed, you know. Um, we're just kind of touching base with everybody in this opening. Uh, what is the name of the other popular girl who is friends with Ruby? Olivia. She is uh, hooking up with her boyfriend. I cannot. She is so pretty and she has this hair and it is just, it is, I'm, I know that they style it and so probably it doesn't naturally do this amazing curl, but goddamn, it looks good. And we have a moment, this kind of got me, where it's Amy and Steve, and they there's like a sweating, and she's in her bra, and it looks like they're having sex. And then it turns out that they are both on a trampoline. And this makes, t like, this is a really good way for them to be handling this, because he is so into fitness 
And it's a great way to like burn off this energy if you're not feeling ready to have sex again. You know, I really enjoyed that. It felt like a a smart way for the two of them. Like between that and the goat, they are really going for it in terms of trying to make this relationship work. And while I don't really know enough about them to be particularly rooting for them as a couple, I like each of them. And I really appreciate how respectful he is of the fact that she's not ready yet. And overall, he just seems like an extremely solid, good dude. And so, you know what? Good for them. I'm happy with this. So yeah, then we get uh, Kyle, the sex king. And he he's underlining jizz on race and we find out later that he says win the race jizz on the face is like the thing that but in that moment he's writing with one hand because he's already started jerking off and it makes a lot of sense how all of this is like all of his advice is based on porn (sighs) y'all can i just tell you how much of a problem this is. And I know I've talked about it on the show before because it comes up a lot. But, and and I am not anti-porn by any means. But the problem with porn as it exists is that it has been historically made for the male gaze and has been produced by men. And there are finally a lot more women who are taking charge in that role and directing and a lot more women who are less ashamed to say that they are into porn. So the market for women is beginning to explode a lot. Um, (laughs) Pun intended. But, you know, it's a, a kind of a slow changeover. And even with those changes, guys are still gonna like seek out the things that appeal to them. And oftentimes what appeals the most are things that are sort of like very simple and quick in a way that isn't actually accurate or it's just hyper stimulating in a way that becomes more and more difficult to sustain. And so there's been a huge uptick in like kind of bite size porn for lack of a better way of saying this, like, you know, you get a, a montage of clips of highlight moments rather than whole videos a lot of the time because they are trying harder to keep people's attention span because folks are not interested in sitting through a bunch of foreplay and, you know, regular fucking anymore. And it has just become this like weird thing that is a, an odd mirror of the way that we're operating with media in general, I feel like it's like similar to TikTok, you know, and don't get me wrong, guys, I'm obsessed with TikTok. I fucking love TikTok. But the whole point with TikTok is that we are consuming these very small fragments of highlights, you know, very carefully, closely edited moments that have been put together in such a way that you get this high impact, immediate, like dopamine hit, basically. And the problem with that is that people become extremely impatient with anything that takes more attention or concentration if they aren't going into it expecting that. And a lot of guys go into sex not expecting that. They have these ideas of how shit's going to go. They have these ideas of what they're going to be capable of and what the women they're hooking up with are going to be capable of. Like I'm just talking purely physically, like athletically speaking Um, and what women look like and what women like and what sometimes they themselves like if they are, if something is suggested, suggested to them that they haven't seen in porn, they'll be sort of weird about it sometimes. Um, And so the fact that he is using this to, Uh, Ashley says TikTok porn. I don't know about that one. Well, I don't mean like TikTok, like porn on TikTok, but you know what I'm saying? Like there's a lot of highlight reel videos out there on porn sites now rather than like full videos. And I'm not saying that they're replacing them, but they're growing a lot more popular. Um, And there's also on a lot of porn vids, like 
for example, on Pornhub, they have that like kind of meter that you can see at the bottom of the screen. And that is showing where people actually stopped and watched versus where they like fast forwarded through. So you can go to a spot that has a really high, like, you know, and watch the thing because you've been signaled by this, that that's where something like really hot happens or that's where like the money shot is or whatever and sort of ignore the rest of the video. It's like built specifically so you can fast forward. Um, but anyway, so this dude is the one, as we find out later, who's giving out really bad advice. Um, and <laughs> I love Vivi. She is just like, she's flashing this guy on screen. He had just taken his shirt off. And we find out later as she's saying to, um, to, Oh my God, why am I wanting to say Jason Jackson that he speaks like six languages? I am extremely curious about this dude. Where did she meet him? What's going on? Because catfishing is the thing. And I just want to be sure that this person is who they're saying they are. But also she is smart. I like to think that she could see through it. But the truth is being catfished has really not got a lot to do with being smart sometimes. You know, people who catfish know what they're doing. And sometimes they will like choose people specifically because of what he, they know they're looking for. Um, but I'm going to try and give the benefit of the doubt at this point and just be like, no, no, no. Yeah, he's totally who he says. This is all for real. And just be happy for her for right now. She also looks really different. And I don't know if like like it's just like a change to her hair or the way that they're doing her makeup or maybe she's like lost some weight or something but she looks a lot more like mature and sculpted in her face she had like a, a much more of a baby face last season and I didn't recognize her right away you know she's just got a very different sort of vibe in this scene because of the like not only the way she looks but the confidence with which she's handling herself considering how she's been with dudes in the last season and how unsure of herself she seemed i was really glad to see this change in her i was pleasantly surprised i didn't know how much things were gonna go for her like go the other way um so I'm just like, I, I want to talk about every single scene in this montage, but I genuinely do not have the time. But there's a lot of uh, lubing up, oiling up. There's one guy who's doing um, VR in his room. And I have to assume that this is a real thing or you could just put your phone in the headset and like, but he's also got gloves on. And so I guess that, like, if it functions with the gloves, it's something specific. I mean, it's sort of a joke, but it's true that anything, like, any advancement in technology is immediately followed up by something to do with porn getting involved. So I'm going to assume that this is really out there, but I really thought I would have heard about it. And no, I have not. So that is a hell of a rig. I mean, sounds like a good time. Um, we go at one point to Rahim, who is literally just sitting and reading a book and eating cookies. And I don't know why I found that like so funny, but also a little bit sad. And he does not seem to be having a bad time. So I don't think I'm meant to find it sad, but I think it's just in conjunction with everybody else who seems to be doing something really like active that's getting their heart rates up that they're excited about and then he is just very sedately reading a book and snacking and i was just kind of like mm, that seems boring but i guess um oh my god the teachers <laughs> and we get just so many like butt shots there are so many butt shots here and I was really happy to even see there's like a couple of girls hooking up and one of the girls is heavier and there hasn't been a lot of representation of bigger bodies on the show. Like Vivi was one of the first ones. And like I said, I feel like it looks like she's lost weight and there's like, you know, she can do what she wants, obviously, but um, it is just nice to see that there is somebody else being put in the forefront that isn't 
the body type we have been seeing everywhere. Um, it is, yeah, tongues. It is just really, really horny. And it was, what a great start to this season. I mean, we get a bunch of O faces after that. And then we cut to this one girl and the guy that she is hooking up with is saying, that was so great, just as he comes. And she flat out says, it was okay. I didn't come, though. Can I just stand a queen real quick? Because I wish, I wish that I had this, like, upfrontedness about sex ever. Even now saying it was okay i didn't come though i don't think i could do it it just feels so brutal and i would be like so like if it were me and owen i feel like it, i would crush him you know this dude i have to kind of admire the way he takes it he immediately is just like wait what and when he asks if she's come with other guys and she st- starts naming other dudes I was worried that he was going to make a comment about how many people she slept with or like, you know, something, because that's what dudes do a lot of the time. If they feel a woman isn't pleased, then they try to slut shame her or take it out on her somehow and turn it around because their own shame is just not something that they want to deal with. And um, instead, he just like, (laughs) he asks, what should I do? And she says... I don't know, maybe do some research and leaves. And I repeat, I stand a queen. She just tells him to do some research. You know what, girl? Nothing but respect, truly. I think it's probably best to actually like talk to somebody while you're having sex and lead them through what you like. And explain certain things about you personally but if he isn't even as familiar with the clit as like later on uh when he's talking about it finally with Maeve and Otis and she says you've got 10 fingers and a tongue it's not rocket science apparently like that hadn't occurred to him so he did need to be refreshed with the basics and i can understand a girl sleeping with a dude not feeling like she wants to be put in the position where she has to hold his hand on extremely basic stuff. Um, so, and his name is Dex. I can't remember her name. and But she, like, winds up not being, like, a major character in this episode. It's just kind of about him coping with the fact that he didn't make her come and trying to figure out what it is he did wrong. And um, he goes to the sex clinic that is being run by this fucking Kyle kid. And it isn't good. It isn't good. He says that he didn't make her come. And at that point, it's Ruby and Otis in the next stall over. And they... The voice that they hear says, what are your measurements? And as soon as they asked, what are your measurements? My instinct was, okay, this is a guy. Because that's what dudes think. If a woman isn't having, isn't having orgasms, it's because something's wrong with your dick. And often, dudes who have big dicks think that's all they need. And they don't put in a lot of effort because they do not understand how many women do not come via penetration. It is just not a thing for a lot of women. It is purely clitoral stimulation and that is all that does it. And yet, despite the fact that something like 60% of women sleeping with men do not have orgasms every time they have sex, and despite the fact that those women are likely sleeping with guys who have of varied sizes and dicks. We don't want to look at that evidence. Dudes just want to 
act like it's a genetic luck of the draw thing. And if you have a big dick, then you're blessed and you're great in bed and you're satisfying women and that's all there is to it. No. Let me just say to you, any dude that's listening, if you have a big dick, sometimes that's worse. Especially if you are not great at foreplay. Because a woman has to be lubricated in order for it to not be painful. And if you aren't getting her worked up sufficiently before penetration and you are really big, it is uncomfortable and something that she just has to sort of grit her teeth and get through. And that is not what anybody wants. So just FYI, there's a reason behind the trope about women needing foreplay. And it is not because we are high maintenance. It is because our bodies work a certain way and that's all there is to it. Um, okay. So we jump then to, uh, Otis and he has a mustache that I just fucking hate. I really hope at some point this season he cuts that shit off. I am sorry kids, but I cannot do it. I cannot do it. It is so distracting. It's not even quite a mustache. Like it is. It, that's clearly what it's like trying to be. But really, it's a smudge of charcoal. Like he's been drawing and just sort of wiped his hand over his mouth after taking a drink of water. And he smeared something and forgot and hasn't noticed. It is truly awful. It is so... <sighs> What I like about this show is that they let Otis be this awkward, though. You know, I mean, this dude is so much more accurate to the way a lot of guys in high school actually look. They're experimenting with their, like, with their style, with their clothes, hair. They're trying to figure out all kinds of things about, like, being appealing and also expressing who they are in the way that they dress and stuff. And there's just a huge amount of awkwardness there. And because of that, I appreciate it, but it is so hard when he's walking around this episode the whole time with this mustache. I was just like, Oh God. Um, and especially like all things considered other than I, I would say Lily, there isn't really a lot of representation of other awkward teen looks. Everybody else on this show is pretty fucking hot and pretty put together. And they all look older than high school, really. But Otis and Lily and maybe Vivi, they're the only ones that I feel like have a look to them uh, in terms of the... Uh, what I remember, at least, and granted, I am 37, so it is not recent, but what I remember it being like in high school. Um, so he's talking to his mom, and she he finally asks if she has told y Jakob about the baby yet. And it turns out that she is about to have like an interview um, on a radio show, and she just tells him, oh, I'm about to go on air. We'll talk about that later. And we find out that she has been driving to his house, sitting there watching him and then driving away again and hasn't told him. And I am so glad that the episode ends with her having told him. And he says when he tell when she tells him and she says that he is welcome to be part of the baby's life if that is what he wants, but only if that is what he wants he asks, can I think about it for a while? And honestly, I don't know why that surprised me so much because I expected him to immediately be like, of course. And as we see later, he goes with her to her scan. So he has decided, I think, to participate. But the fact that he even had to like take time to consider I shouldn't be mad at him. This is a massive thing that just got dropped in his lap. And she's like, uh, clearly like five months along, you know, but I, I had a moment of just like, you have to think about it. And that is not fair of me at all. 
I also would like to mention that the actor is still so damn hot. And I think that he was in the new West Side Story that I watched. And I don't, I actually can't remember if it was him or not. Anybody who feels like looking that up. But the new West Side Story by Steven Spielberg is a fucking masterpiece. I loved it. I loved it so much. As far as I'm concerned, it is the only West Side Story that exists. And everybody should see it. So moving on. Okay. So she's getting this in, this interview about her book. And these DJs. It is so frustrating. Um, It is so like they are being it's not even like exactly disrespectful, but it, it is disrespectful. But that doesn't feel like the main current of what's going on. It's just like these two are just children. They're acting really immature about the whole thing in a way that's like embarrassing And they're asking her to talk about the book and she's talking about the curriculum and the ineptitude and that she was trying to fill in gaps for these teenagers that were, you know, they were sexually active, but they didn't have any information or correct information. And when she is explaining what the book is, he responds with sounds a bit racy And I love the expression on her face when, like, she looks genuinely confused and taken aback. And kind of is like, if by racy you mean it's comprehensive and easy to read, again, it is not actually... These two haven't read it. And that's what keeps sort of coming up, is that there is a reaction to her book, but there does not seem to be a reaction coming from people who have actually read the book. I'm not sure if the book is out, out yet or what's going on. I think it might not actually be completely out yet. And maybe that's what's going on. But regardless, these, these two are just coming at this from a sort of titillation standpoint. And it's not at all, accurate to the the energy that she's trying to give and there's a a sort of lack of focus on what was going on in the school like they mentioned the chlamydia outbreak but they do so in such a way as to be like oh my god isn't that shameful instead of seeing that as a symptom of poor education again you know like their focus is completely in the wrong place and oh man it's just tough because there, I don't know how many of you guys have seen this like thing going around with Turning Red, which is a uh, Pixar movie. Is it Pixar? But it's a movie that came out like last week or the week before. Went straight to, to streaming, which um, is a whole other conversation. But it is about, I believe it's Chinese Canadian girl. Um, her family... I think hails from China. She was born in Canada and there is a certain like tradition um, and expectation in the culture she's growing up in that is different than an American expectation might be, you know? And there is a lot in this movie because she's 13, the main character evidently about her, growing interested in guys and rebelling against her mom and using like sometimes her friends use like sort of they say crap which apparently has like shocked a bunch of people and it's the kind of thing that is so telling because the number of films we have seen with boys as the main characters at this age where they they behave like this is uncountable i mean there are so many movies that are like held up as classics i mean the sandlot anyone you know and when we put a girl in the same situation it's suddenly seen as encouraging bad behavior somehow problematic and it's like because of course we think that because we never actually have bothered to represent the true experience of a girl going through puberty 
because we don't like to face that because we have a problem with female sexuality to begin with, you know? And uh, so people are being shocked or acting titillated about things in that movie that are just the reality of growing up, getting older, having really strong emotional responses to things because your body is turning into a completely different organism than what you have been living in. And the reaction you're having to stuff may seem out of proportion, but that's not under your control. I don't know how many of you clearly remember the way that you were feeling when you were 13, but I remember it and it was a fucking nightmare. And it only got worse. Like for the next few years, probably three years, I was a disaster. I fought with my mom every day. We usually had a great relationship. And like following that, we began to have a better relationship again. But there was a period there where I was just like rebelling against her every step of the way. And it was the reality of me and a lot of my friends' experiences. But we don't we don't want to acknowledge this stuff. And it's weird. You know, it's like honestly kind of pitiful. So moving on, we have a moment with Maeve. And Maeve is actually a little bit more background this episode than I was expecting. But it's okay. I don't mind for right now. And we have, um, she is finishing off homework or something. And she is at the house of the guy in the wheelchair. What is his name, guys? I'm forgetting his name. But he, Isaac, is it? He is still not telling her about the message that Otis left. And what I found sort of interesting was because Otis never hears from her, I like there was an assumption that I had that eventually there would be a conversation about it. But because she doesn't reply he just assumes that is the message. She doesn't reply. And that is all he needs to hear to know where she stands and that she doesn't really want him in her life anymore. And I never thought that it would just get left there. And I'm not mad about it because honestly, it makes sense. If you send that kind of message and you assume that person got it and they never replied and they never address it when they're around you, I also would just figure they don't feel the same way. And I personally speaking, I would not leave it alone. I would ask, but that is the kind of person I am. I'm kind of confrontational when it comes to people that I'm close to. And yet I understand very much why Otis has left it and just been like, that's all I needed to know is that she doesn't even want to reply. That tells me everything. So that's fine. And I'm just going to let go of it because it seems like that's what she wants me to do, which is honestly pretty respectful. You know, um, it shows a little bit of growth on his part because he hasn't been willing to do that before. But Isaac not having told her and continuing to lie to her about all of this is really ugly to watch. I am so torn by it because one, he's actually pretty funny. And in some ways, I think that he's right. Like in, in respect to what happened with her mom, I just have to say, and I know I've said this at the end of the last season, but as far as I am concerned, Maeve did the right thing. And her mother has absolutely no right to be behaving the way she is in response to what Maeve did. She can feel hurt all she wants. But what Maeve did is a direct result of the hurt that she inflicted on her daughter repeatedly during her developmental years. And this is her reaping the results of her own parenting. So you can be angry, but you also have to face that you have so much responsibility in how this went. And she's not doing that. And so Maeve feeling guilty about it just pisses me off. I want to go up to her and like just shake her and be like, this is not something for you to feel guilty about. You were doing what you needed to protect yourself after having been shown that you couldn't 
rely on her over and over and over again. I'm not mad at it, you know? And Isaac, he is reminding her that she was right and she did the right thing and to not forget that. He is funny. He's also really cute. He's looking cuter to me this season. I don't know if it's like the facial hair or what, but he... mm, Something's happening there. So I want to like him, but I can't forgive that he deleted a message like that and is just not going to tell her purely because he's into her and he doesn't care about her feelings on the matter. That is not consensual. You know, if she's going into this unaware of the truth, then it's garbage. That's it. Straight up. So I'm just sad about this because it feels like Maeve is surrounded by people who are screwing her over all the time. And I want better for her. And this sucks. Um, so then we have her getting picked up for school by Amy because her mom decided it's safer for her to drive to school. Arguable considering that she tries to go in reverse and almost run somebody over. She does hit them. Um, they seem to be fine, but good God. And then we have Otis and Eric riding their bikes to school. And Otis clearly doesn't really approve of the relationship between Adam and Eric because he's still worried about Eric's overall behavior. Or not Eric, Adam's overall behavior. And Eric feels that Otis needs to try harder to get to know Adam and be receptive to him and give him room to change as a person. And we have a scene a little bit later where somebody is like making homophobic remarks to Adam and he knocks the kid down and makes a bit of a scene. And Eric, having been the guy who got knocked down has a real moment here of like, are, are you really going to do this again? And you're going to do it right in front of me. The, you know how I feel about this. I can't believe that like day one, you're back to it. Are you serious? And he just takes off and Ola sees the whole thing. So she goes to see Adam later and I really appreciated how she is able to talk with him to get to the heart of things because what it is essentially is he doesn't want people to see him as weaker because he's gay. He still wants people to see him as like masculine and essentially like somebody to be respected. And he doesn't know how to do that without giving into his anger because his anger is the only thing that he really knows of that is like strong in quotes and masculine. And this is the thing, isn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, there's just such a thing with like toxic masculinity, labeling any emotion other than anger as weak. You can be angry and that's allowed. But anything outside of that is weak. And so men are only allowed to express anger and any other emotion they may be having gets somehow transmuted into anger. And thus you never actually get to like have a conversation about what's really going on because they're so worried about this image. And she gets him to see that talking about it is like the only way. He can punch things to get some of his physical feelings out. But in the end, that's going to be the only way that he feels better about anything. And so later on, him and Eric are walking into the locker room. And I really expected there to be a whole thing with the guys being weird about gay men in the locker room with them. Thankfully, it doesn't turn into that. But he comes in and some guy makes a joke about like, oh, are you a puff now? And... He's like, has, you can see, he has the flash in his head of just decking this guy and taking his whole mouth of teeth out. And instead he just says, yeah, I am. Is that all right with you? And does it in this 
fucking big dick energy sort of way. And I say that knowing that he actually has one. So, okay. But you know what I'm saying? Like he just stands there solidly spoke very clearly and waiting for a response in a way that feels extremely strong and in control. Rare to see in a high school kid, you know, and everybody backs down. And he's like, no, no, no. Yeah, man. Like, good for you. Congratulations. I think it's really cool. And I love Otis is like, you don't have to congratulate somebody on being gay. And I'm like, okay, you don't. But congratulating somebody on like coming out. I think that's valid. And that's basically what he's doing. Like, it's not like everybody didn't know because he's walking around holding hands with Eric. But like, you know, um, and, and while they're in the locker room, this is when Dex comes running in. And it turns out he's trying to do some research on what the average dick size is and unfortunately for him he walks in to see adam's giant fucking dick and turns and flees in horror because adam is not a fair metric by which any man should measure himself it's honestly really well done though oh yeah chica, chica. And he goes running to the, like, abandoned bathroom, locker room. I don't even know what the, like, building originally was. But he's trying to measure his dick. And he's trying to get it hard to measure after measuring it flaccid. And then, and there were two things here. And look, I'm not mad at it really but i did have two moments of going like this feels like a little bit too much one the fact that he gets completely naked to measure his dick he is down to his socks that feels a little bit not the way a dude would handle that normally you know like he why would you even take your shoes off and everything that does not you know but he has to in order for the next part to make sense which i would also argue doesn't really make sense and that he has his like pants and shirt draped over the top of the bathroom stall. And he has his bag that I am assuming has the shoes in it and everything on the floor of the stall. And that teacher comes in, whose name I can't remember. And she came in to like have a smoke, I think, and then sees um, Emily. She sees the clothes and bag. And assumes somebody left them. Guys, correct me if I'm wrong. But if you see clothing draped over a door, a bathroom door, and a bag on the floor, like, in the stall. That bag is not outside of the stall. It is in the stall. And she bends over to reach the bag and has to really reach for it. You would assume there's a person in the stall. Am I wrong? Like, come on. Granted, again, it has to go this way in order for her, for, for him to be wound up stranded with no clothing, but him getting completely naked and then her assuming there's nobody there and this is just lost clothing. Both of those don't really make sense if you stop and look at them at all. Again, I will say it's fine and I'm not like mad about it. But I had more than one moment of going, this behavior does not line up for me. Um, Ashley says, I don't know if you're taking your pants off and you take your shoes off first. The shoes at least make sense. I'm not thinking you would even have to take your pants off. Most guys would just drop trow. And stand there with their shoes on the way, you know, like there would be no need to completely take your pants off, but whatever. Um, and <laughs> Ashley says, no, you wouldn't because it's against the rules for students to be in there and students would never break the rules. That's the other thing. And that was part of what came up in this scene as well is the fact that this building is the source of so many problems from the past two seasons. And I was genuinely surprised it was still here. But they wind up sort of solving that problem by the end of this episode because the new headmistress has it knocked down. And it's sort of the end of an era. I appreciate the the melancholy that Maeve and 
Otis are feeling and they sort of are looking at this as a metaphor for their relationship and it being really truly over and I think it's more of like their relationship up to this point hasn't been honest they like one another and care about one another but there hasn't been a moment of them each being fully honest with one another in a lot of that time and this building represents secrecy and anonymity and i feel like that can only mean good things if we're going to look at it as a metaphor for their relationship personally um so this 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 scene okay so i should mention that there is a girl that jackson kind of runs into in the hallway i am saying girl because that is the the vibe that I was getting. But maybe I should say there is a person and use they pronouns because I think what's going on, they're in the bathroom stall also like secretly and they're getting changed. And when this building gets knocked down, the camera goes over to them and they have a really frustrated expression. And I am going to make a guess here that this person is either trans, non-binary, or just dealing with like an identity that they aren't able to fully embrace when they are at home. So they're changing into different clothes before they go into the school. And it's a much different thing to change in an outbuilding and then enter the main building than it is to enter the main building wearing one thing and change in the bathrooms there after everybody has seen you already because now they know what you're being forced to wear versus what you want to wear. And that means that they are going to be seeing a side of you that you don't feel is you at all that you're interested in sharing with the world. So now they're going to have to find a different place to change or they're going to have to find a way to like slip in when everybody has almost all gone to class something. Um, but yeah, they, they like, I'm very fascinated by what we're going to do with this character because they run into Jackson and they have a bit of a moment. They like sort of do that dance where you're each trying to get out of each other's way, but inadvertently keep stepping into each other's way. And uh, they make this sort of like bow and gesture for Jackson to go by. And he does. And then he stops and sort of gets like a smile on his face. And I was like, is he into them? Like already? It seemed like he like had a little bit of a moment. And I was like, you just met them but they do have like a strong there's a real sense of personality even in that small gesture so maybe that's what you know because he seems that he is drawn to very big personalities um and i would definitely be here for jackson being interested in somebody who might not be a gender that he has always dated. And I'm assuming that he has only dated women, but I'm not positive about that, but I think so. So I'm here for it. Um, but also I would be fine if it was just like, you know, a, a completely uh, platonic relationship. No problem with that either. So yeah, I just felt for them though, because like seeing the one place that you felt you could go and become who you want the world to see and then having that like taken away on day one or like day two I guess it is at this point that sucks you know you think you figured out the answer to your problem that you can go with for the rest of the year and then it's like nah think again so they're gonna either have to get like changed or dressed in the woods or figure out a whole other thing um so okay jumping ahead again we have the whole issue with um, Otis and the sex king and him deciding whether or not he wants to out the sex king because Kyle is dangerous. As we see him literally like his lit his crotch on fire at one point. And <laughs> I, I really understand. Otis is just like, oh, my fucking God. But this dude has dirt about him 
and Ruby. And I just like <laughs> Ruby is so honest with Otis about not wanting to be seen with him. And it was like so mean. But also there's a part of me that really does appreciate that she doesn't mince words about it. He asks her and she tries to be like, well, I'm very private. And he just like, come on. And she's like, all right, fine. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I appreciate that you are just going to be truthful with him about that. I have not experienced this sort of thing because I didn't have, to, I, didn't, I haven't dated that much in my life. But I have known different people, men and women, who eventually figured out that they were the secret relationship. Either they were the other woman or other man, and they had not agreed to that and didn't even know the person was already in a relationship. Or they were somebody who was not conventionally attractive, and that person felt like they were dating beneath them. And while they enjoyed the sex, they didn't want you know, it was like the same situation and they weren't aware until it became increasingly obvious that they were never doing anything publicly, that they had not met this person's friends or family. And it is an awful feeling. Like, I mean, I say this again, third person, because I have not experienced it, but I can only imagine realizing that you have been like being that vulnerable with a person who respects you so little. And Otis, like, good for him. He immediately is like, oh, well, fuck this then. And he gets out of the car and she just drives off. And I was like, one, I respect her for telling the truth eventually, even though she's doing a shitty thing. But I really like that he just immediately goes, mm, no, mm, what we're not going to do is just use me and act like I should be grateful to you because you're hot. That's not how this works. And eventually he tells Eric, who we find out basically is the one who spilled the beans to everybody. And that Eric, I really did think better of you, but because everybody knows already, it sort of ends with her coming up to Otis and being like, all right, well, everybody fucking knows. Do you want to keep having sex? Cause I do like having sex with you a lot. And he's just like, yeah, all right. And they just like make out right there. And I love her friends watching just being like, Oh my God. Because like, again, Otis is just such a creep looking right now. Like with that must, I can't, you know, so I don't, I'm not mad at them for their expression. Like I, it, for me, it feels like it's much beyond a social thing at this point. It's just like, girl, really? Why? You know? Um, so in the midst of all this, there's the new headmistress and she is, it's a weird thing. The way that she enters her name is hope. She is seen as extremely cool and relatable right away. And I mean, in comparison to their old headmaster, not exactly a high bar. And yet we have a really great moment that I fucking loved. Jackson and Adam are both waiting to speak to her. And she knows that there is one guy who is here to re-enroll after dropping out. And one guy who is a famous athlete and head boy. And she comes out and sees a, a black boy and a white boy. And she immediately goes to the white boy, assuming that he is the accomplished star student. And it is just such a transparent moment. And I can't tell if she realizes the misstep that she made, but I think she does. And Jackson just has this look on his face, like fucking of course. And she asks Jackson to come back. Which was sort of like, it felt like a bit of a snub. She asked him to come here, but then she's like wanting him to leave and return because it's not quite convenient for her at the moment, which was a weird thing because her talk with Maeve and Otis takes like five minutes. And all she wants to know is about whether they're still doing the sex clinic. And eventually Otis comes to her and tells her about Sex King. And she, that's why she knocks that place down. But, um... When she finally does see Jackson, 
she's explaining to him that the values of the school are going to change and she wants him to start taking his role as sort of a representative for the school more seriously and says, quote, I'm not really into the whole cool guy thing, if you get what I mean. And he says, I don't. And she just says, you will, as she's leaving. And I got to say, from a woman who put on the performance that she did as she came out on stage, the I'm not into the whole cool guy thing rings pretty fucking hollow. So I don't know, girl, what you're talking about, but it seems like you're very much into the cool guy thing. And she hands him a pamphlet with like the new school values. And I am dying to know what they say because he has an expression on his face when he's reading through these. You know, I don't know. Um, We don't get any more of, like from him this episode, I don't think. But it's clear that he isn't excited about whatever it is that she's planning. And throughout all of this, there's the whole thing with like the eyes of the media sort of being on them. And there's a camera crew there to interview her. And she is in the middle of this interview when Dex goes running by stark naked in just his socks. There's something so much more humiliating. I feel like about being in your socks than being just stark naked. I don't know. But he had run across Amy who had taken her goat out to pee and he grabs the goat to shield himself and he goes running past in the background carrying a goat stark naked and it's just like it could not possibly be a more humiliating moment for this headmistress. Like I swear I I don't really like her yet. She feels real false to me. But I don't wish her ill yet. It's not like I'm mad at her about anything. And this, I just really felt for her. What a terrible first day. And um, eventually, Otis and, uh, and Maeve catch up with him and are like, dude, what the hell? And they have that talk with him. And eventually we see him and his girlfriend and he hasn't gotten her to come, but she says that it was so much better and he's very proud of himself. And that was a pretty good bit. I I like the fact that it's not magically, oh yeah, he made her come. It's more that, oh, he's making progress. You know, I like that. I think that's a much more realistic view on things. Um, So I'm trying to make sure that I haven't missed any major storyline this episode we talked oh i know we haven't talked about the headmaster he is uh staying with his brother and his brother is lucius malfoy first of all and his brother is obviously really successful and he has gone on a bunch of interviews and is not getting any bites because his previous, like what happened at the previous school has really sullied his reputation. And so he comes back to his brother's place, a building that's like a beacon of money and success and being very flashy about it and lies and says that he got the job and he like starts next week because he can't bear to be a failure again. And honestly, I hated it. And I'm just going to call his brother Lucius right now. I know that's not his name, but you guys are going to get what I'm, who I mean anyway. He is so great in this. He is one of those, like, if this were not 2022, I would say that he was coked out of his mind and he may very well be coked out of his mind, but I don't think so because he seems to be so obsessed with health. I would say probably if anything, he's hyped up on like caffeine pills and creatine, you know, something like that. But I don't think that this is a guy who would use recreational drugs, at least not that way. But this dude is so in his face and so, oblivious to the struggle his brother is going through and so like kind of 
complacent, I guess, about his own situation and talking about the secret to a good marriage is money, which unfortunately, that's not entirely untrue. Like the number one cause of divorce is disagreements about financial issues. Um, so yeah, this whole thing with his brother is really like watching him foiled against a character like that is fascinating. And I didn't think I'd be that interested in what was going on with the headmaster at this point, him getting fired being the end of his storyline, I wouldn't exactly have been mad about. But because he's still Adam's dad, he still might be around. I'm, I, I'm fine with like continuing to look at what's going on with him. Um, oh, God, sorry, there were comments and I didn't see. Uh, Ashley says, just for the sake of not misgendering someone, I'll say that they aren't cis and use they them pronouns. Okay, good, good, good. Um, Rowan says, I love Chase and Isaacs, but he always plays such assholes. Yeah, that's fair. I love the headmaster's arc. He's just so bad at being in touch with his feelings. And the actor looks so much like the guy playing Adam. That's that. So I had to look up to see whether they're related in real life, I think is what Rome was saying. And they're not. Um, that's funny because I think I'm kind of bad at this. There are so many instances with actors where they're playing brothers or they're playing father and son or whatever, and they, people say that they look really alike, and I don't see it. I believe that they do really, like, but I am not, a, like, catching on to it right away by myself the way that a lot of people do. This happened with a couple other things that I've read where people will, in multiple reviews that I read and multiple posts from friends, people were like, wow, the casting for so-and-so is amazing. They totally look related or they totally look like the same person, but older. And I was like, do they? So I will take your word on that, Rowan. But I can't say that it's something that I actually register because I don't know why, you know, it's just not like, I guess it's just because I'm so aware of them being actors that it doesn't occur to me to even worry about it, I think, or think about that. But, you know, stopping and sort of standing back, I guess I see what you're saying. It just didn't catch my attention, if that makes sense. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the headmaster, I'm very curious about if he's going to get a job and if he like, or maybe the direction of his life will totally shift and he won't stay in education at all anymore, which I think is probably better because he doesn't like the job. It's really clear he doesn't like it. He doesn't like kids. He needs to do something else. But when you're at his age and you've been doing one thing your whole life, it's not easy to change things up and still be able to make a living it's that's just like factually that is a difficult thing to do so we'll see we'll see um but anyway okay i have to wrap up i'm over time but thank you guys all so much for hanging out with me thank you again ashley for commissioning this i'm so excited to start this season and i will be seeing you again soon with a new episode until then toodaloo motherfuckers <laughs>